Thank you, Boki. And, and I want to thank also the organizers to give me the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about the work we are doing in, uh, in Rodwell right now in the group of Misha Kasmerson and um, about this chromatic highlights to the ferromagnets. Um, so this is the outline of my talk, and so I will start uh, talking about what we already know about these chromatic highlights. Then I will show you a little bit about the work we are, some un undergoing work and some of the work we have already done uh, in, in, in Rabout. And then uh, uh, to end my talk, I will give you some take home message. So, uh, so first of all, this, this community highlights has, has been already known from a long, long time ago. Uh, uh, so this is from Cameron Ones in, in Leiden. 1925, they were, he was already talking about uh, anomalous um, susceptibility in these kind of chromatic halides materials, but has been only, uh, took like 40 years to start to uh, have some information about the magnetic ordering in the bulk of the bulk of these materials. So, uh, and we know that the bulk of chromatic iodine and the triiodide and the, and the bag of chromium tribromide, we have this uh, ferromagnetic interlayer coupling. Uh, but actually for chromium trichloride, uh, we have uh, an antiferromagnetic in plane interaction. So the interesting thing is with, uh, we, have, we have been waiting for more 60 years to, to get some insight in what happened in, in ultra thin uh, samples of these materials. And now we have techniques to exfoliate. And uh, uh, so, would, so the, the, the experiments show that the, for chromium triiodide, this interlayer magnetism changes from ferromagnetic to antiferromagnetic. And for chromium bromide, it seems to, to keep ferromagnetic. And for chromium trichloride, it, it also uh, keeps antiferro in plane. So, and uh, actually, uh, some of these materials can be, the monolayer of these materials have been isolated very recently also. And, and, and actually for chromium triiodide and for chromium tribomide, these materials show ferromagnetism. In the case of chromium trichloride, it has been very difficult to isolate a single monolayer. So uh, I won't say anything about this because there is a, a, a talk about uh, this material by, by Amilka, uh, tomorrow at night, so I will let him to, to show you what they have already found. But it seems that it is possible to stabilize a, a ferromagnetic in plane uh, a phase in this material. So here I show the, the, the figures that uh, the experimental Moki and, and reflective magnetic circular dichroism experiments uh, perform on this material. This is, uh, uh, sorry for the point, uh, uh, yeah. So this is for monolayer bilayer and three layer, and you see this hysteresis for uh, odd number of, of layers. So, so now let me go to the microscopic, uh, at the micro, go to the microscopic level and electronic structure calculations. So in the monolayer, this material saw this hexagonal structure of chromium atoms, and they are surrounded by these allies forming an, octa an octahedral ligand field which creates a, a, a field splitting, a crystal field splitting, uh, which makes these D orbitals in chromium to a split in T2G and EG. This has, a, this has been already shown in, in previous talks. And so, and this chromium three plus has three electrons, uh, three valence electrons, and they go into these T2G orbitals and, that, and they become half field. So if we do DFT calculations without any kind of, of spin interaction, what we get is actually this. Uh, so we see here the P orbitals, this, this bands comes from the P orbitals of iodine. Uh, here we have the T2G, we, which are half field, the Fermi level is set at zero, and at high energies, we see these EG orbitals. But as soon as we uh, turn on uh, electronic uh, Coulomb interaction and, and spin interactions, we open up a gap and uh, this T2G and EG orbitals uh, uh, split in this way. Uh, for majority spin, this T2G become uh, mixed with the P orbital of iodine 
the majority EG bands uh, uh, transform into the balanced band. And then we have this T2GG of the minority bands at higher energies mix here. So, and then the question is, what's the magnetism, uh, the, the, um, the mechanism uh, of exchange in this, in this material? So how these uh, local magnetic moments in chromium uh, uh, form this long range interaction. And uh, it seems that this is, uh, this is um, this is due to super exchange mechanism, uh, a la Goodenough Kanamori, uh, where chromiums are uh, interact through the ligand. And uh, as you can see, most of our most of the theoretical calculations show this uh, 90 degree angle formed between, between chromium ligand chromium, which agree totally with this Goodenough Kanamori rules for super exchange mechanism. So if one looks into the uh, interlayer exchange values, uh, one get this, uh, these are around one, three milli electron volts, uh, which uh, explain why the Curie temperature of this material is, is actually very low. And, and this, this, this number goes down for chromium bromide indeed. And if, if there is a very interesting thing, it is that if one look into the orbital dependence of this interlayer exchange, one can see that there is a two competing interactions. There is an antiferromagnetic interaction between the T2G's orbitals in different chromiums and, an anti and a ferromagnetic interaction between the T2G and EG orbitals in different atoms. This is very interesting because one can think about the possibility to tune the magnetism in these materials between ferro and antiferro. So still we don't know how to do that, but uh, it, is, uh, it is a very interesting that this, um, the, this orbital engineering can give us uh, some, some possibilities to tune the, the, the magnetism. So then let me go now to the, to the bilayer case. So what happened when we, when, uh, we put uh, another layer on top? And uh, actually we know from bulk experiments that uh, these materials undergoes a phase transition at around 220, 230 Kelvin for chromium iodine and for chromium trichloride, and that uh, transform the material from a monoclinic uh, uh, structure, crystal structure at high temperature to a rhombohedral crystal structure at, at low temperature. This doesn't happen with chromium tribromide. This happens at, uh, actually it happens, but happens at way higher temperatures like 420 Kelvin. So this is the reason we don't see uh, uh, this uh, transformation from, um, uh, we don't see uh, any kind of, of change in the stacking configuration in these materials at low temperature. At, uh, uh, so, uh, and we have, uh, there has been a lot of, of work on, on understanding why uh, this material shows a different uh, ferromagnetic ordering, interlayer ferromagnetic ordering, when one goes from bulk to, to bilayer. But uh, after all this bunch of, of papers and publication, we now understand that uh, the interlayer interactions in the, is very strongly dependent on this stacking configuration. And actually, uh, based on the, my previous slide, the, the, the idea is that in the monoclinic uh, stacking, uh, we uh, enhance these T2G, T2G interactions which are uh, antiferromagnetic, while in the rhombohedral uh, stacking, we are enhancing the T2GED, which gives uh, rise to this ferromagnetic uh, uh, interlayer ordering. So actually, uh, if one looks also into these uh, ex interlayer exchange values, it is of like two orders of magnitude smaller than, than the interlayer ones. So at some point, one can think about the possibility to tune this interlayer magnetism through uh, external perturbation, really small perturbation. And I will come back to you, uh, I will come back later to this. Okay, so another very interesting thing that has been already shown in previous talks, uh, 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 maybe you have, uh, you remember the talk by Bar van Des, uh, the first talk of, the, of this uh, nice workshop and uh, talking about the possibility to, to transport spins through magnons in these chromium trihalides. 
And it is very interesting that it is, uh, this has been uh, um, uh, the work, uh, these minons, these spin waves can be uh, proved using this inelastic electron tunneling spectroscopy. And different groups have some uh, um, these, uh, these very interesting spin waves. Uh, and, but a very interesting thing is something that we, uh, at least I, don't, I still don't understand so well, is, is these very different features that one, so this is chromium tri triiodine, this is also chromium triiodine, and we see some splitting of these peaks at five milli, millivolts, and that here is absent. So there are several features that change from one experiment to the other, and uh, it is very interesting, and I will come back also to this later. So, uh, and very recently, there is a, an additional ingredient and very interesting ingredient uh, to these spin waves, which is the fact that it seems that there is a, 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 a gap opening at the K points of the uh, magnum dispersion. And this is uh, related to the, to the presence of, uh, this has been uh, um, told to be related to the presence of key type of second neighbor diaphonensky mori interactions. And this is very interesting because uh, these are to, this, this, uh, this kind of, of, uh, of an isotropic interaction gives rise to topological effects and topological magnonic effects. And one can think about the possibility to, to induce these uh, topological magnons in, in, in a strip configurations of this material. So anyway, uh, uh, the point is that uh, anisotropy is still an open issue in these materials. We still don't understand so well the origin of all this anisotropy. And uh, there is a lot of discussion about uh, Kitaev, second neighbor, diaphonisky moria And if you see in this table, the numbers uh, it are completely different from, exp from uh, different experiments and different theory. So, and... Indeed, there is uh, more controversy right now. Uh, if you see this recent preprint by K and Kasnel, so you can see the poster by Rick and K, which is uh, also uh, in, this, um, in this workshop, uh, about the possibility to open this K, K point uh, gap induced by strong correlations. So uh, as you see, this is uh, the, the controversy and the, and, and, and the different possibilities are still open to understand this anisotropy in this material. So then let me now go into, the, into this undergoing project uh, regarding Coulomb interaction in chromium triiodide. And the point is that um, uh, these materials are somehow strongly correlated materials. And uh, because as you see, the Fermi level, uh, when for un, uh, spin and polarized uh, uh, phase, we have this Fermi level crossing these T2G bands, and as soon as we uh, uh, turn on these uh, Coulomb interactions, we open the gap. So the gap in these materials is driven by Coulomb interactions. Also, we have seen that uh, the uh, intralayer exchange is very, very sensitive to, to these Coulomb interactions. And actually, GW calculation by the group of Stephen Louis have seen that uh, uh, screening effects are very important in these materials, and, and the quasi-particle gap, uh, it is like three times larger than the electronic gap. So based on that, we have uh, decided to, uh, st to, to um, start to work in a new approach where we can add this Coulomb interaction in, in a post-processing way. So the point is that uh, we can extract the Banner Hamiltonian from first principles without, for chromium D orbitals and for iodine pi P orbitals without interaction. And then we can add interaction using the hearty fog approximation and calculate the electronic structure say consistently. So we can, uh, we can tune by hand all the, the Coulomb parameters, the, uh, the on-site, the inter-orbital on-site Coulomb interaction, uh, the whole Coulomb. So, and this is very interesting if, uh, because our preliminary results show that actually we can get very similar results than DFT using this approach. But on top of that, the very interesting thing is that now we can take these Hamiltonians and plug it into the uh, magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic force theorem that was uh, 
proposed by Liechtenstein and Kasnelson in the 80s. And we can calculate the effect of these Coulomb interactions in the uh, exchange interaction of these materials. So, uh, so now that we have this methodology, we were interested on, on how dielectric screening effects can modify this uh, Hamiltonian for these materials and how this can uh, uh, somehow affect the intralayer exchange. And these dielectric screening effects uh, due to the substrates are very interesting because most of the experiments are done on encapsulated chromium triiodine samples. So what you see here on the left is the, uh, uh, the electric field uh, lines, uh, uh, the electric field lines uh, in, in, in a 2D chromium tri triiodide. And actually, if uh, so in this case, electron uh, the charge are not uh, uh, screened. So we expect that the U is very high, like, like you see here on the, on the right. But as soon as we uh, encapsulate this material, there is uh, this uh, reduce in an effective way the Coulomb interactions. And of course, this has a, a, an impact on the uh, intralayer exchange interactions. And as you can see, as the dielectric constant is increase, we see a, re a reduction on the Coulomb interaction and also a strong reduction of the intralayer exchange. So of course, this, has, uh, this should have an important impact on the quasi particle and acetonic gap. Uh, I have to, uh, here, uh, I have to say that I had the luck to collaborate with Malte Husner, which is uh, an expert on calculating this Coulomb tensor using CRPA techniques. So the very interesting thing is that now that we have access to how the Coulomb interaction affects the exchange parameter, the exchange intralayer parameters, we can then calculate the spin wave dispersion induced by these uh, dielectric screening, substrate dielectric screening effects. And as you can see here for different dielectric value, constant values, we see how the features of the Manon spectrum changes. So, I still cannot say anything, uh, from, I cannot give a final conclusion about this, but maybe this difference on the features in the spin wave spectrum here in the experiments might be due to some kind of dielectric effect coming from the substrates. But this is very interesting because a spin wave spectrum, magnon spectrum can give us some insight about the dielectric environment of the sample. So these are the conclusions for this part. Uh, this, uh, again, this Coulomb and substrate dielectric screening effects has an, an important impact on the magnon spectrum commentary halides. And, uh, and, I have, uh, and it is very important that we have developed this new uh, approach that allows, allows us to study Coulomb interactions in these materials, combining binary hartree fock and magnetic force theorem. So, uh, now let me show you a very interesting uh, um, work I performed together with Misha Kasnelson uh, about magnetic polarons in bilayer chrome triiodide. And, and as I told you uh, before in, my, in, in the introduction, uh, the interlayer exchange is very small in these materials in the few layer limit where you, we have this monoclinic stacking. This, uh, this interlayer exchange is quite small. So one can think about the possibility to tune this interlayer magnetism using uh, uh, external fields. And actually, uh, two years ago, the group of Ji Shan and, and uh, Kim Fai uh, Mak and, and also the group of Shadon Shu, they demonstrated the possibility to uh, tune this interlayer ferromagnetism from antiferro to ferro just by doping and uh, by, by external doping using an uh, uh, gating. So, and a very interesting feature is that this antiferro to ferro transition occurs only for electron doping, but not for hole doping. And this is very interesting stuff. And, and then, uh, so at some point, uh, uh, Misha Kaznelson came to me and say, and say uh, so, you know, I have, uh, some uh, old work in my mind about magnetic polarons. 
So maybe this is uh, the mechanism of for explaining this interlayer uh, tuning uh, in these uh, bilayer chromium triiodide samples. And this magnetic polaron mechanism consists in uh, uh, the, the point that uh, if one adds a spin into these uh, fer antiferromagnetic semiconductors, uh, so the electron, the, uh, the addition of this new spin is going to point in, in the direction of reducing the gap. So if, and, and in this situation, if, if the a new spin align with the other layer ferromagnetically, well, uh, if, if the gap is, is closed, then the formation of a magnetic polaron is allowed. And then this electron becomes self-trapped here and form a, a small ferromagnetic region around it. So the situation is that as we start to increase the doping, we start to form these patches, these magnetic polarons. And actually, this kind of phase, heterogeneous phase, has been already predicted in the 70s by Bisher. And so at some point, if we continue increasing, we induce the ferromagnetic transition. So the, the good news is that uh, this uh, actually uh, happened in, in chromium triiodide. And if we compare the, uh, the antiferromagnetic band structure with the ferromagnetic one, what we see is that the gap is actually uh, strongly reduced, at least for the in, in the electron side. And this is very interesting because if we calculate the formation energy for a magnetic polaron, uh, using this very, very uh, uh, simple uh, formulation that uh, was, uh, in this, this was formulated by Mott uh, several time ago. Uh, so what we see is that the formation of magnetic polarons for electron doping is a strongly favored in this material, but it is strongly forbidden for holes. So this is very interesting because it is the same thing that people have observed experimentally. And actually, our DFT calculations show something very similar. If we dope with electrons, the antiferromagnetic to ferromagnetic transition is very fast. We just, uh, we just need to, to add very small uh, doping, very small density of electrons to induce this transition. But for holes, we need uh, a lot of them. So this magnetic polaron is uh, uh, helping to induce this antiferro to ferromagnetic transition in these bilayer materials. And actually, this has been already uh, observed by the group of Alan McDonald's. Uh, you see here that for electron, they have also this very, very fast transition. So let me conclude this second part, uh, saying that, of course, this electric field modulation of interlayer magnetism is driven by magnetic polarons in bilayer chromium triiodide. And that the formation of magnetic polarons is, are only, uh, is only allowed for electron doping and, this and not for hole doping. And this facilitates this antiferro to ferro phase transition. So in the last five minutes, just let me go to, uh, I would like to give you some take home message. And the point is, there, is, there are still several open issues in these materials. So we don't understand, still don't understand uh, actually the origin of magnetic anisotropy. We have single ion anisotropy, Kita F anisotropy, second neighbor DMI. So, and this is still uh, far from being understood. We are still, uh, there is still a, a lot of room for improvement for undervalued functionals. And there has been several papers showing that different functionals uh, are not good to, to describe uh, the interlayer ferromagnetism in these materials. Of course, the effect of substrates on the magnetic and electronic properties of these chromium halides are important. Uh, you see the, the, the talk of, of Barb and Bess the other day. There have been several talks here talking about uh, the behavior of this material on top of platinum. Uh, of course, there is a, a very, very uh, new uh, field 
growing, uh, which is these mo moiré magnets and, and the possibility to, to, to look at these twisted uh, chromium tree halides by layers uh, with very, very interesting properties like uh, flat magnum dispersions. So uh, this is a really, really interesting new field. And of course, uh, the magnetotical properties, because uh, this is still uh, in a, this is the growing uh, topic, and and we don't know uh, perfectly uh, all the property, all the magnetic optical properties of this material, and how they uh, depend on the ligands, for instance. So, and uh, another thing is that, of course, this these uh, materials uh, are allowing uh, for the number of device concepts uh, based on van der Waals heterostructures, including these two different magnets, is growing very, very fast. And right now we have this, we, we, we have the possibility to interface these two different magnets with graphene, and we have quantum anomalous Hall effect prediction, magnetic tunnel junctions, van der Waals spin valves, we can uh, interface with TMDCs and we can have photo detectors. We can even uh, observe Majorana fermions. We can uh, try, uh, this is a very interesting uh, proposal, these degens, spin valves, and, and, and the very, very new and very novel stuff is this possibility to look into these moiré ferromagnets and these twi twisted to the magnets. And, and, uh, and also the possibility to observe skirmions in the moiré of the bulk of this material. But I will let this for Kang Wang that I will, he will give a, a talk this afternoon. Uh, so, and just for the coffee break, I have to say that uh, related to this, to, the, to these Van der Waals structures, uh, I have been uh, collaborating very recently with Jose Lado in Alto University, and we have seen that uh, it is, possible, it is possible to uh, induce, uh, 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 to modify uh, and to have a strong effect on the correlated flat bands of twisted TMDs by proximity with these magnetic insulators, these 2D magnetic insulators. And we can go, and depending on the, on the uh, relative order of, of, the, of the magnetization of these uh, from magnetic insulators, we can go from a spin magnetic uh, spin polarization to valid polarization in these TMDs. So then, uh, let me finish. Then uh, um, say uh, uh, just uh, so when the people that has uh, collaborated in in this work, uh, Professor Misha Kasnerson, Matte Husner, which is the the guy, the expert on these CRPA calculations, uh, Sasha Rudenko, all from uh, Rada University. Uh, Joaquin Fernandez Rosier from INL in Portugal, and also Jose Lado in Alto University. So thank you so much for attention. Thank you.